Well, hello everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast. Normal behavior of rodents, understand it, then respect it. I am Marcel Perregentil, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We have a few important announcements uh, to make before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, so we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit a, your, uh, your problem through the green Q&A button on the lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Marina Snitkowski. Uh, Dr. Marina Snitkowski has is a DPN, has a Master's of Science and a PhD. And her academic background uh, encompasses a uh, doctor in veterinary medicine who graduated with honors from the veterinary school at the Buenos Aires University in 2004. Her field, uh, fields of expertise are in clinical ethology, animal behavior, and neurosciences, laboratory animal science, biostatistics, and experimental design. She's a diplomat, uh, diplomat in canine and feline internal medicine uh, from De Las Americas University in 2009. She's also a diplomat in clinical ethology from the Latin American Veterinary Ethology College in 2012. Uh, she has a specialization in st statistics for health sciences, science, uh, sciences school, Buenos Aires University in 2004. She has a, a master's in, in psychoneuroimmunoendocrinology from the Favaloro University, which she obtained in 2012. She, uh, she's a master's student in laboratory animal science and welfare uh, at the Barcelona University in Spain, or she will be in, from 2015 to 2018. Uh, she has a PhD in neurosciences, veterinary school, uh, Buenos Aires University 2013. As you can see, Marina is very, very well qualified for this presentation. Her current position uh, she's at uh, the IBCN Laboratory Animal Facility Manager in Coordination and Supervision of the Animal Health and Welfare Medicine School, Buenos Aires. She has been in that position since March 2012. Her professional she, membership of the Career for Research Support of National Research Council, CONICET, uh, at Institute of Cell and Molecular Biology. Medicine School, Buenos Aires University. She's an ICOT member uh, at the Veterinary School Research Institute at Del Salvador University. She has been a member of the ICOT since 2013. She's a board member of the Argentinian Association of Laboratory Animal Science and Technology. And she's a pro secretariat since March 2014. She's a head professor of biostatistics and the Veterinary School at Salvador University since August 2008. I will now turn it over to Marina Snipkowski for her presentation. So Marina. Well, thank you, Marcel, for that very kind introduction. Um, good morning to everyone. I would like to thank you for being there, for choosing this lecture, and to thank the organizers of this event for inviting me. And also, I would like to apologize for my poor use of English, since as you know, I'm from Argentina, so this is not my mother tongue, but I'll just do my best, and I think we'll manage. So, let's talk about behavior. We can define behavior, as an individual response, an animal response to stimuli, whether the stimulus is internal, 
for instance, a change in a hormone level or an external stimulus, such as a change, a variation in the environment. So the main function of behavior is to allow the animal to adapt to those variations in the environment. And also, for our benefit, behavioral response is a salient variable. I mean, something we can see or we can even measure. So that response will be reporting us about an internal processing, something very complex that is happening inside the animal. And as we cannot see it or touch it or measure it, we can infer about it with the salient variable that is the behavioral response. So this internal processing could be a physiological state, for instance, estrus in a female. Whether um, we can also infer about pathological states, such as sickness behavior, or even emotional states, for instance, fear. We can infer that an animal is fearful uh, with its behavior. Also, we can know what motivational state the animal is on uh, by seeing its behavior. For instance, uh, hunger or sexual arousal. Also, this behavioral response can allow us to assess the well-being of that animal, always with objective measurements of these behaviors. And um, we can assess also the adaptation capabilities of that animal, observing uh, its behavior and its behavior response to change in the environment. But I really wonder if we, we know the normal behavior patterns of the animals we work with, of the animal species we are used to work with. In order to know the normal behavioral patterns, we should know first the natural history of that species. That is, um, which are its ancestors, its wild ancestors, and what evolution and domestication are made uh, and, and provoked changes, not only in their features, their external and phenotypic features, but also in their behavior. That is a process we can call in our world uh, a process of laboratorization, that would be domestication of laboratory animals. So we should know the behavior, phylogeny and ontogeny, and of course, which captivity induced variations were um, across the time of evolution. So if we know, uh, sorry, if we know how the normal behavior is, we are capable of assessing if there's an altered behavior, which could be due to a physical illness, or even to emotional distress, such as um, transportation, um, any kind of experimental procedure, or even a social conflict. So if we know how the normal behavior is, and we can recognize altered behavior, we will be able to respect and to ensure animal welfare, knowing that one of the freedoms that we usually try to respect by ensuring animal welfare is the freedom to express normal, normal behavior. Of course, in order to respect it, we first need to know it. So actually the behavior repertoire of uh, rodents is very complex. I'll just choose in this talk to speak about some of the patterns that I think are most important for the the animal facility manager. Of course, all of the patterns are important, but we are going to discuss social, uh, agonistic, territorial, exploratory, sexual, and maternal behaviors today. But first, we should uh, review what are or how are sensory systems in rodents, because, of course, they are very related to the expression of normal behaviors. So smell. Olfaction is obviously the best developed sense and is required for uh, food finding, for territory recognition, for uh, predators and, and social cues. But also, they 
uh, the um, sense of smell provides a very important exchange of information system, whether it's um, the um, secretion, urine, feces, and even uh, scent gland secretion. There are a few compounds that are very important for this communication via uh, smell sense, but are, for instance, major urinary proteins and pheromones. We are going to talk a lot about pheromones today. What about sight? Actually, sight is the least important sense in rodents. As you may know, their vision is dichromatic, that is, they are blind to, to red color, but they can see ultraviolet. Also, they have a very poor, poor visual acuity, especially in albino strains. It is worse, it is even worse, but they can see a high contrast cue. About hearing, well, you may know that they have a broader uh, spectrum compared to human, and they uh, can vocalize in an ultrasonic sound. So, of course, we are deaf to that. And to, in, a, in order to hear it or, or to measure it, we need a special apparatus. Um, this ultrasonic signaling is used for uh, mother pup calling, for sexual calling, and also um, for warning about predators or cage intruders. And about touch, they have a very specialized hair, uh, tactile hair, that are called vibrisa, um, that is uh, connected with a very specialized region in the brain cortex in order to integrate that information. But what happens with their sensory systems in captivity, in our animal facility conditions? Actually, we usually use a very bright light, which is not the best for their sense of sight. It would be better to use a red light when it's possible, or a yellow light, or a mercury light that is less bright. Same thing or similar happens with environmental sounds. Actually, sometimes they are, they are exposed to electronic devices and other equipment sounds that maybe they have, a, they emit an ultrasonic sound. Of course, we don't know because we, not, we cannot hear it. What about smell? Uh, in our daily, daily basis of bed cha uh, bedding change, we remove their odors and it makes disappear, uh, the, the, their scent marking disappear. So it might, it doesn't always, but it might uh, create some sort of social problems between cage mates. So a good idea would be to renew only, uh, let's say, a 90% of, of the bedding and leave 10% uh, remaining of the old bedding that has the, those special scents scent, uh, and, and odors that are very important for them to mark their territory and their social relationships. And about social behavior. Actually, social behavior should, we should say that it's the most important behavior we should study in world and sun in every animal. Uh, there are different social aggregation patterns. A species could be strictly gregarious, it could be solitary, or it could be sociable, or semi-social, or facultative gregarious. It depends on the resources, and of course it depends on the species. It's very specific of the species. So uh, in order to have um, a social behavior, they need to communicate with each other. As, a, as we said, communication can be visual, uh, through gestures and body postures, tactile, through touching each other or, or passing against each other or huddling, and of course it's very important the olfactive and semiochemical communication, that is the pheromonal communication, and the vocalizations that, that as we said, they could be audible or ultrasonic. There are different social behavior patterns. 
for instance, social attention, that is to detect and to uh, go towards uh, con specific social investigation, smelling and vocalizing, and agonistic behavior that we'll discuss further on. Uh, of course, for the social behavior to exist, it has to be organized. So um, every species has its own, its own social organization and hierarchy, and we will discuss this as well. So the species that are strictly gregarious, for instance, bats, guinea pigs, and gerbils, uh, they need and they must aggregate. They have an inner drive to aggregate, to live together. Of course, this um, social life um, provides protections, provides easiness to find food. So there's a hierarchy, there's a social organization that uh, is usually called colony. And it's a harem like organization. The hierarchy uh, starts with the dominant male, that is usually the biggest and the heaviest one. Um, he dominates over food, over space control, and of course over reflection. Usually in a colony, only the dominant male is able to reproduce, to mate. And of course, this. Um, dominance it's, um, is shown with dominance postures, with fighting, with barbering, that is more typical in, in mice. So continuing with the hierarchy comes the reproductive female group that they have the, their own hierarchy among females and they usually um, raise up the, the pups together. We will talk about it later with maternal behavior. Then the subordinate males, and then the young and the juvenile. But what about mice? Actually, mice should be considered as facultative gregarious species, because they can live together, and they would, they, they would aggregate or not, depending on resources and of course, depending on their own conspecific attraction, that is the internal factor that makes them to live together. Actually, the my social order is yet poorly understood. It is supposed to be a despot mouse, then a codominant mice group, and then the subordinate mice. And the only species we usually work with that is solitary, uh, species is the hamster, as you may know. So what happens in captivity and social behavior? Actually, uh, we need to know how the social pattern is in order to respect it. Uh, the gregarious species should be housed, worked, of course, and actually this social housing is supposed to be the best source of enrichment. Um, given the um, proper amount of space in the, in, and the proper cage dimension and of course the number of animals and if they have enough resources because if not uh, it could um, generate competition and fighting. So there are some uh, experimental proceedings that that need, let's say, social isolation, sorry. Um, when it's for short periods, like surgery or some experimental procedures, well, it can be, let's say, tolerated. But when it, when it is for longer periods, it is actually the main source of emotional and social distress in gregarious species. So, so we should be aware of this. And there are a lot of behavioral tasks that um, are developed uh, over these social interactions. For instance, social defeats, in which we should take into account that it's stressful both for the intruder and for the resident, 
This is usually used with mice. They can be both stressed out about this uh, social interaction. And we also should be very aware that there can be some social communication behind us because they can communicate through ultrasound vocalization and pheromone sensing that we are, we are um, deaf about it and we cannot see uh, what's going on. And they can warn each other <laughs> about something that is going on because they have um, alarm vocalization and even alarm pheromones. What happens with agonistic behavior? That, of course, is very related to social behavior and it's needed to, um, to make the social structure um, uh, remain, let's say. So the um, aggression or the threatening postures that has to do with dominance and with submission are uh, usually there's some um, posture of offensive aggression or dominance um, as a threatening posture that involves pile erection, kyphosis, sometimes persecution and, and approach, uh, sometimes allo grooming, and as you can see here in the picture in, in mice it's very common the barbering, uh, that is the chewing of the, the fur of the subordinate in this case. And there can be fighting, biting, boxing, and, and wallowing in a fight, especially between males. And the defensive or submission posture uh, that is actually intended to have an, let's say, an appeasement function. Um, it's usually a lateral position or a spine position uh, exposing the ventral abdomen, as you can see in the above picture uh, with two rats uh, fighting. Um, when one of them is acquiring the dominant position and the other the subordinate position. So there are uh, very typical sequences. First starting with an, let's say, ambivalent posture, trying to maintain distance, and even if the, the animals I mean, if the animal is uh, subordinate, it can even freeze uh, to avoid and to appease um, the dominant behavior or aggressive behavior. Uh, if possible, the subordinate will try to escape. And if not, um, the dominant will try to attack or the subordinate will try to defend itself. So what happens with the agonistic behavior in captivity? As I said before, we should respect the aggregation pattern of the species. Um, that is, if the species is gregarious, they should be grouped house. While if it's uh, mice, for instance, that they are facultative gregarious, we should um, see if we <laughs> should uh, group house them or not regarding uh, depending on resources, habituation to cage mates, number of animals, the cage size, etc. And about regrouping, well, actually, we should never regroup um, adults, especially if they are male, um, if they were not raised up together, because they, they will fight, of course. Also, we need to recognize those postures of dominance and submission. And in the case of mice, especially, we should recognize, recognize this so-called Dalila effect, that is the over grooming and the over barbering that can even cause an ulcerative dermatitis when it's excessive, of course. Okay, about territorial, be territorial behavior. Actually, the communal or the group territory makes protection, finding food, and storing large amounts of food uh, a lot easier. Of course, it depends on the animal density and on resources. And the main functions of uh, territorial behavior are social functions, reproductive, of course, for instance, nesting behavior, residential, that is, I think it's 
I have a misspell here, sorry. Um, when there are low activity periods, the animals just um, hang out there in, in their territory. And of course, they can use it to um, defend themselves for, from predators for food storage, as I, saw, as I said before. And this uh, territory is very well defended, uh, usually by the dominant male of the colony, with uh, territorial aggression to intruders, whether they are conspecifics or predators. Um, well, I, I said this before, mice are very territorial against an intruder, and this is even uh, used in a behavioral task. Um, so the territorial behavior of the wild ancestors of our laboratory animals is to dig or to burrow um, underground galleries and tunnels with um, caves with several, several entrances. Usually these entrances are uh, next to some stones or bashes or uh, a bunch of leaves. leaves. Uh, in order to recognize this, uh, this territory and the entrance to go back as if it were a benchmark for them to recognize. Uh, they, of course, they also use olfactory cues to mark their territory with urine, urine I'm sorry, and uh, fe fecal marking, and also with scent plants marking through pheromones. Um, rodents have this um, very specialized and developed sense of recognition and sp spatial orientation. They use the environment, environmental cues and special keys and benchmarks to recognize their territory. And as they can form a cognitive map about their own territory, this is very used um, for behavioral tasks um, that are uh, assessing special learning, such as mazes, all kinds of, kind of mazes um, are based on this behavior. Uh, what happens in captivity and territorial behavior? Actually, due to a small cage size, usually, um, the um, territorial behavior and the kinetic behavior, it's very little expressed because they don't have enough space to express it. Um, nevertheless, we can increase this uh, space or the way of expression of territorial behavior by uh, environmental enrichment, uh, for instance, using tunnels or stairs or ramps, as you can see in the picture. And if they need more exercise, because in the wild, their ancestors will, uh, would um, walk long distances to, in order to find food, um, which doesn't happen in captivity. So we could uh, enrich their environment and try to make um, them make more exercise by using a running wheel or uh, different levels in their cages. Also, we can use loose material so that they can dig and burrow and uh, to express the nesting behavior that is very important in rodents, especially in mice. And exploratory behavior that is uh, very related, of course, to territorial behavior. Um, it's very intense in rodents. Uh, and although this is a self-motivated behavior, that is, it has um, inner drive uh, to explore their environment, uh, it always increases with novelty, with a new uh, stimulus. So the exploration for the environment has its main functions to get familiarized with this environment, to find new escape routes from predators, to search for food and for mates as well. And rodents have these uh, distinctive motor patterns to explore. They can either walk, run, jump, climb, dig, 
And if it's not to explore their, 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 I'm sorry, their environment, their surroundings, and they usually do it in this typical segment of uh, fast progressions, then attention, and they stretch to smell a little bit further, and they continue to, to march uh, to where they were going. And they use a, a wearing posture as well to see what's farther away. Uh, this exploratory behavior is also uh, used as, um, as a, a normal pattern um, to, to make some behavioral tasks that are based on this exploratory behavior. Um, for instance, all kinds of mazes. So what happens in captivity with exploratory behavior? Actually, our animals live in a very monotonous environment. That is, they don't have any novelty or very little new stimuli to get involved in exploration. So what can we do about it? Um, well, we can enrich their environment with some novelty and with some complexity in the environment. It, of course, will induce exploration. We can use several objects. We can use, well, as you can see here in the picture, um, whether it's something you buy and it's quite expensive or it's something you normally throw, out, uh, throw away at the, in the garbage, such as cardboard tubes and boxes. So um, any of these objects and these um, environmental enrichment devices will um, increase exploration and, um, and enrich their complexity in their environment. But we should be aware that excess of novelty uh, is also stressful because it makes the, the environment very um, difficult to predict, very unpredictable, and that is also stressful. So we should balance the novelty uh, so that it's not stressful for the animals. Uh, well, sexual behavior. Uh, sexual behavior is ruled mostly with, um, by pheromones. As I said before, pheromones are very important for communication between rodents. Um, it's what is called semi-chemical communication because it's a chemical way of communicate. And it's involved in courtship. Uh, there are sexual attraction pheromones. And well, courtship actually involves also ultrasonic calling for, for mating. <clears throat> But also these pheromones are um, involved in a few um, special, let's say, effects on behavior, sexual behavior, and on endocrine uh, variations in the physiology of the animals. For instance, the Van der Berg effect that um, when there's a male uh, present, it can accelerate the puberty onset on a group of prepuberal females, only due to pheromone uh, scenting. Uh, there's the Leibut effect that uh, when no male is present, the group of female will have irregular uh, estrus cycle or even no cycle at all. They, they will not be cycling. And on the contrary, the Whedon effect um, explains how the male urine scent uh, with these major urine proteins I mentioned before will elicit estrus in cycling uh, female. And this is very used for synchronizing estrus. This is very, very commonly used in animal facilities to synchronize female estrus. Actually, um, we should be aware of this Bruce effect. That is when a different male, that was not the, the mate of the female, um, is present during the first third of the pregnancy, they can, uh, be, there can be um, 
up to 50% embryo resorption. So we should be, uh, we should take care of this as well. What happens in captivity with sexual behavior? Well, actually, uh, all uh, reproductive weight depends on management. Um, it all depends on us, on, on the managers. Um, the directed mating is actually against the natural preferences of animals. Um, it does not respect nor hierarchy nor preferences because there are preferences uh, for mating. And um, even worse <laughs> is inbreeding because it goes against the natural preference uh, that animals have for unrelated major cell compatibility complex. I mean, they try to mate with animals that are not related to them. And in inbreeding, we do exactly the opposite. So we should be aware of that. Of course, we used um, some of the effects I told you before to synchronize estrus. We use it, let's say, in our benefit. Um, and that can be made by using a little bit of bedding that is um, that has some male urine and putting it in the um, female cage. What about maternal behavior? Well, birth, as you may know, is usually nocturnal, so it's very difficult to see and of course take pictures of. That's why this one is very difficult to see. That that female mouth is given birth. Um, and parenting is a very complex behavior pattern. Uh, it's actually cooperative, it's communal uh, among the various species such as rats. And it also can be um, communal among mice. Um, this alone nursing um, exists and it's, it's uh, very typical and we can even use it for our benefit if we have some orphan pups. That means that a female will nurse uh, pups that are not of her own, but were birth, um, given birth uh, from another uh, female. Also, the parenting behavior includes licking of the pups, uh, giving them physical protection, uh, uh, recovering and transporting uh, the pups through this scruffing behavior that you can see in the pictures. And of course, in order to nurse um, their, their pups, the female will adapt um, this um, lactating posture, um, uh, you know, lying with um, exposing her her belly in order that um, the pups can nurse, can, can milk. <clears throat> so what happens in captivity and with maternal behavior? Actually, um, all management problems can affect pup survival rate. Oh, so again, it depends on us. Um, why is that? Because all sources of stress, like for instance, noise, smell, uh, I don't know, odors, overpopulation, they can lead uh, to maternal behavioral disorders, such as pap neglect or maternal indifference. There is lack of maternal care and, and nursing and the proper nursing. So, um, Actually, it is, it is very rare to see pup killing and cannibalism. Even though it is reported, what usually happens it, uh, is that pups can die because of um, bad mothering or, or a lack of maternal care. And then there's uh, the normal scavenging behavior that is part of the um, uh, feeding behavior, the feeding pattern that is um, absolutely normal in, in rodents. So actually, um, it's not that common to see cannibalism, but to see um, a female feeding 
with the pub corpse, but probably she didn't directly kill it. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Ah. Sorry. Uh -huh. Oops. Well, um, what I, I, I wanted to tell you that also excessive maternal care, excessive leaking uh, can be um, uh, bad for the pups. I mean, it can even, um, well, maybe not kill them, but it can um, injure them by an excessive leaking. So probably Sigmund Freud will agree that excessive maternal care is also bad for the pups. Okay, and now to sum up, um, as I've said before, we need to first know and understand what normal behavioral patterns are in rodents in order to respect it and to ensure animal welfare. It is very important then to understand the rodent ethogram and to study it because it will help us to assess welfare in animals. As I said before, as a salient variable that will tell us about internal processing, very complex processing that is happening underneath, and about emotional states of those animals we are studying. And if we want to ensure the freedom to express normal behavior patterns, first we need to know them. If not, we will not be able to respect them. And also, if we know how normal behavior is in rodents, we will be able to select the proper animal model for, um, I don't know, some task we need to do or for an Ill illness we want to model. Uh, we will be able then to um, decide which species to use, which strain, and um, if there is a behavioral disorder in that animal as a model of a human behavioral disorder, we need to be able to recognize normal from um, abnormal or from illness um, or from a disorder. Also, if we know how normal behavior is, we will be able to um, select uh, the proper or the best behavioral task we should use for that model. For instance, for a neuropsychiatric disorder. And um, as I've said, we need to uh, know the normal behaviors in order to know how to assess them and how to measure them because they do not necessarily uh, going to be measured the same way. And as I have said at the beginning of my talk, we need to recognize the altered behavior from the normal one. And for that, we need to know how the normal is. So um, finally, I'd like to recommend you a few reading material. Um, that you can find, well, even in, the, there's a, a website that you can see and several papers and a book. Uh, you can consider reading if you want to explore a little bit, a little bit more about normal behavior. And um, with this, I would like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for being there. Gracias. And um, well, I'm willing to hear some questions from you. So I'm giving back control to Marcel.
Well, thank you, Marina, for such a great and informative presentation. Wow, so much that I can apply to my program. I know I'm going to be calling you in the future for help, and uh, so impressive. But before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Then, uh, so our first question is going to be um, uh, from Shelley Germscheid from University of Manitoba. How do you manage stereotypes, typies, such as the circling of one mouse amongst its cage mates in your facility? Marina, I'm passing it. Marina, I'm passing it. Controls. Okay, so uh, stereotype is. Um, let me see if I'm on air. Yes. Uh, First of all, circling behavior can be a behavioral stereotype, of course, but also you should uh, first assess if there's not any um, physical illness that can um, express circling behavior as well. For instance, an inner ear uh, illness. When you rule that out, if it's um, mainly a behavioral problem and it it's only displayed by one mouse in a, in a cage, uh, you can use some environmental enrichment in that cage if you didn't have any, because uh, usually this um, stereotypical, stereotypic behavior, it's very dependent on the environment um, uh, conditions. So you can try that. Mm, you say here one mouse amongst is its cage mates. Um, I'm not sure I understand your question about that because circling behavior is usually something that it's um, a self-directed behavior. It is not directed to the other mice of the cage. Um, if you mean a mouse that is circling around another one, that can be uh, the start of a um, fight, <laughs> so you should be aware of that. Uh, maybe uh, think about separate that male, for instance, from the others. Um, uh, let's get back to Marcel. Okay, thank you very much. And by the way, um, for the individual, the, there was a comment here that, Marina, don't be concerned about your English. It is perfect. Brent, thank you for that comment. Okay, this question is from Robert Gump from the Food and Drug Administration. And why sounds and vibrations? Why not, uh, well, not ideal. Would you think they adapt to them over time relatively quickly, the same for smells? Okay. Okay, um, it is true that it, they can adapt and adjust to those um, noises, even if they're uh, ultrasonic one. Uh, the thing I'm concerned of is about new, let's say, uh, sounds or smells that are not, they are not familiar with. Um, we can imagine that, that they will habituate eventually to uh, a sound of an equipment. But the thing is, we don't hear the ultrasonic sounds that that device 
might uh, be um, generating. And ultrasonic sounds can interfere with their communication. That is why I think uh, it's a main concern to, well, it can be measured with, of course, the proper devices. Um, so we can see if, I don't know, a computer, for instance, uh, has, um, is um, uh, generating um, a lot of ultrasonic sound. So we might think of, uh, I don't know, putting some somewhere else or um, farther away from the cages. Okay, the next question comes from Argiro Zakariodaki from the Experimental Research Center, Elpen Pharmaceutical Company. How would you deal with finding in a cage of rats? Isolate the one who is dominant? Oh, here. Here I am. I'm sorry. Something going on here. Oops. Okay. Done. Um, so the question was, how do I deal with uh, fighting rats? I shouldn't um, isolate the dominant one because actually isolation is also um, harmful for a social species, for a gregarious species as rats. But what you can do is first to assess if uh, there's only one rat fighting with all the others, because it doesn't always um, look like that. I mean, sometimes they all fight with each other. In that case, you should try to see if uh, there's a way to enlarge their um, cage or to enrich their cage with uh, some environmental enrichment that they can all use as a social enrichment. For instance, if there are rats, um, tubes, or um, a cardboard box where um, one of them can hide, for instance, the subordinate can hide, you can uh, separate some rats that are fighting, but uh, you won't uh, want to isolate them, I mean, to, to house them, uh, uh, single house them. Um, so you can separate them in, I don't know, two and two or two and three, well, depending on the, uh, how many are they. I hope I answered your question. Thank you, Marina. The next question comes from Saskia Arndt from Utrecht University. Could you please provide us with references regarding your statements regarding, for example, the effects of what you call social isolation and regarding the social organization of the different species? Okay. Well, social, um, isolation would be to be single housed uh, for a species that is strictly gregarious. There are uh, some behavioral tasks based on social isolation that use the isolation as a source of social stress that is the most typical source and, and most harmful source of stress in gregarious animals, such as human, <laughs> human beings, actually. Um, so that, that's why I mean um, with social isolation, to have a strictly gregarious animal uh, housed by itself without cage mates. Mm -hmm. Thank you again, Marina. The next question comes from Damien. O'Donoghue from Prospect Solutions. We breed spray dolly rats in trios. From time to time, we need to interrupt breeding for a week or two because of holiday periods. 
we usually remove the stud males and house them alone for the duration. Would it be better to house the stud males in pairs or small groups rather than house them alone during these breaks? Okay, this is a very interesting question. Um, if they were, I mean, if the, the original cage was one male and two or three females, uh, you shouldn't uh, cage, um, uh, put in a cage all the male bre um, breeders together, even in pairs, because they will definitely fight, especially because they are breeders, so they have this, um, they are empowered to reproduce. To, to mate, so um, they are, they will probably fight against each other um, because of the, the social order. But, but what you can do is uh, you can single house them, but uh, next to the female cage. Um, well, it depends on the type of cage, but in order to allow them to see each other and, if possible, to smell each other. And even if um, you have wire uh, cages uh, to touch each other, they say uh, that would be something uh, to recommend. And if not, um, if you have some um, male breed, uh, breeders that are were a group house together and were, were raised up together, for instance, they are siblings, um, then you can regroup them together. Um, in these uh, breaks, uh, because they are used to each other, uh, they are used to the, the other cage mates, but never regroup um, males, especially breeders, that weren't used to uh, each other's company because they, they will fight, definitely. Next question from Theresa McKernan from Animal Care Systems. Recently, we have been taught to transfer nesting material from the old cage to the new cage, as there is aggression inhibiting urine odor cues in the nest. And not to transfer all bedding because it has aggression inducing urine cues. Can you please discuss? Okay, um, it's true that transferring the, let's say, previous uh, nesting material or bedding material comes with the urine scenting of the, um, let's say, previous cage. It's actually the same cage. Um, so it carries all the urine scenting and marking of the um, cage mates. So um, it means that uh, not only this um, aggression uh, inhibition uh, scent, but also which um, hierarchy uh, order has each of the cage mates. That is why it's advisable to do this um, transferring the old material to the to the new bedding or, or to transfer the nesting material. So uh, in order to keep the social hierarchy and the social order quiet and without messing with it. Because when, when animals know uh, which is their, their hierarchy that is status or, or the social order status, they do not need to fight. But if they don't know because the sun marking um, is lost, uh, they will, um, let's say, fight again uh, to ascend in their social order. That is why um, using the old bedding or nesting material is helpful. Okay, the next question comes from Elizabeth Falendis from the United States Geological Survey National Wildlife Health Center. How can we know what is the right balance of enough novelty and not too much to be stressful. What cues might we use to decide that our enrichment program has the ideal level of novelty? Uh, 
Okay, this is a, a great question and it is very difficult to answer it. <laughs> but, um, well, one cue you can use is um, in an environment, environmental, sorry, enrichment program, you need to set up uh, how often and which type of enrichment material are you going to use and to exchange. Um, if the animals are explore, exploring the, um, the, the, the new objects, let's say, uh, it means it's still a novelty when they stop. <laughs> Um, exploring it, it's because they are habituated to it. That's wh when you want to change it, to renew it, when they have stopped exploring it because it's not new anymore. So if they are still exploring their surroundings and the objects and chewing them around and, and I don't know, climbing into them, depends on the objects, of course, uh, then do not change them because they are still uh, a great, um, let's say, novelty stimulus. stimulus. And if you change it too soon, then it can um, generate an unpredictable environment. The next question comes from Corey Abbott from uh, Techmira. The question is a little bit difficult for me to understand, but let's see, uh, Marina, if you can respond to this. I'm going to read exactly how the question is asked. Lee boot effect, male in the room, different cage can cause this effect? Okay, um, it depends on how far this cage is in the room, but um, if it, let's say, if it's near enough so that uh, the other, I mean, the female can smell them, uh, the, I mean, the, the male, it can cause this liberty effect as well. Um, actually, many times this is used um, as a way of trying to synchronize um, the, the estrus of female just by putting the male in the same room. It depends on the um, size of the room and where the male cage is regarding the female cage is. If it's near enough so, so they can smell each other, or, well, smell is the most important thing here. And remember that pheromones are volatile compounds. I don't know if it's said right um, uh, so it, it can travel in the air uh, even if we don't notice it so sometimes just being in the next shell in the next shell <laughs> it's enough to produce this effect next question is from Maria Andres from cellular and molecular biology I try to enrich with paper towel rolls, but the rats eat them very fast. Is that okay? Or shall we avoid giving them these kinds of toys? Okay, um, actually chewing and knowing it, uh, um, a, a sort of exploratory behavior as well, but you don't want them to eat the material because it can be harmful. Or at least if it's not harmful, because probably paper towels will not be harmful for rats, but, um, well, it won't last very long in, in their cages. So you should try with um, a thicker paper, for instance, not towel paper, any other, I don't know, cardboard, that they will chew and eventually they will probably eat little pieces, but it will last longer. Uh, you can use this, um, for instance, disposable cups um, as a way of enrichment and nesting material. They will chew it as well, uh, but probably it will last longer. Okay, let's do one more and then we're gonna to have to wrap it up and know that there are other 
uh, questions, but I think we're running out of time. So, say, uh, for Maria Andres also, the question is, shall we keep adult male and female rats separated, but in contiguous cages? Well, this is very similar as um, I said before. Uh, yes, if you want the female to be cycling and to um, elicit the estrus, yes. Um, but make sure that they are not only contiguous, but they can smell each other, see each other, um, and even touch each other if you want. This is a way of um, avoiding them to mate if you don't want to, but um, they are close enough to smell each other's pheromones, so all those effects I told you will will take place. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. I want to thank the audience for their interesting questions and participation in today's event, and of course, Marina, very well done. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through August 2015. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. So see you next time and goodbye.